Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll hear music from Hannah Lou Woods. But first, our guest joining me now is Dr. Larry Napoleon, Jr., uh, the uh, NDSU School of Education professor. Dr. Napoleon, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Well, you're here today to talk about Black History Month, yes. but before we do that, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and maybe your background. Yeah, so uh, my background, I would say uh, personally, uh, I'm a, a proud native son of New Orleans, Louisiana, um, son of a hard-working, blue-collar uh, dad and a, a devoted, uh, loving mother and a nurturing older sister. And I uh, think that those things were very important to shaping me. Um, academically, uh, I am a graduate of two HBCUs in New Orleans, uh, Dillard University, where I have a, a bachelor's degree in, in history, uh, Xavier University, where I have a master's degree in curriculum and instruction, taught in the New Orleans public school system for five years before moving to uh, Pennsylvania where I earned uh, a doctorate degree in curriculum and instruction from Penn State University. Uh, following that, fate led me here to NDSU uh, in, in Fargo and I've been here for 14 years now. Okay, well 14 years. Uh, let's turn to what you do and, and things you've done. I understand you've organized and moderated a number of panels uh, in our area dealing with race issues. Can you talk yeah. about some of that? Yeah, so I've, I think um, I, I would say I've organized a few. I've been a part of many, right? So um, whether that be through campus, uh, lots of different uh, initiatives uh, that, that focus on, um, on black history or, or racism, things of that nature. Uh, and then I've had the, the esteemed honor of speaking um, at uh, Juneteenth events for the past couple years. Uh, I've spoken um, at the uh, Fargo Film Festival. Um, and it's, it's just been a, a wonderful opportunity to, to be here and to offer uh, my insight and talent uh, as it regards to uh, an issue that um, is definitely one that's, that's plagued us uh, in, in our, our society, historically and in a, in a contemporary sense. Yeah, absolutely. But you're here today talking a little bit about Black History sure. Month. Yep. So uh, can you say, you know, what is it and how, how and when was it founded? Tell us about it. Yeah, so, uh, so Black History Month, uh, which has its, its roots, uh, well, first of all, that's, uh, I'll honor the, the father of uh, Black History Month, and that's Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, so Dr. Woodson um, was an author, a journalist, but most notably and perhaps most importantly, he was a historian. Uh, he was uh, completely dedicated to researching, promoting, uh, and, and disseminating information regarding the achievements and contributions of African Americans, right? Uh, 1915, Dr. Carter uh, co-founded an organization that really poured resources into that, that effort, conducting research uh, on all the contributions and achievements of African Americans. Um, I believe about 11 years later, it was 1926, was the first, what was called then, Negro History Week. And um, he chose the second week of February because that week aligned with the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and the, the great Frederick Douglass. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's birthday is February 12th. Frederick Douglass's birthday is February 14th, or his adopted birthday, he didn't know his, his exact uh, birthday, uh, but he adopted February 14th because his mother called him her little Valentine. So because of that, in honoring uh, those people, the second week of February was, was chosen for Negro History Week. That went on um, until Gosh, about uh, five decades, roughly. And in 1970, um, in an in initiative to expand Negro History Week to Black History Month was, um, was pushed forth. And about six years later was the first time Black History Month was acknowledged by a sitting president. And um, so it's been since 76. That, um, that we have a formally recognized Black History Month in the United States. 
All right, so yeah. Uh, is there a theme this year? I understand there seems to be a theme every year. Yes, there's a theme every year. Uh, this year's theme is black resistance. And what, what does that mean? What, what, what will happen with that theme, do you think? Yeah, so I think uh, with black resistance, there, there is an, an honoring there in the historical tradition of, of African-American struggle, right? Um, since 1619, right, when um, slaves began to arrive on the, the, the shore, Africans uh, began to arrive on the shores of the United States, um, and even actually before then, right, even uh, boarding those vessels over here, um, there was always resistance, right? There's been resistance at every level of, um, of, of life and, and in every decade, every, every iteration of, of the black struggle here uh, in the United States. Resistance has been central um, to our progress uh, and to our thriving. So I think it's, you couldn't find a more fitting um, theme than black resistance because even as we sit here now in uh, 2023, um, resistance is still very much uh, a part of our stories and a part of our daily lives. I believe you're right. How, how many countries observe Black History Month? Yeah, so I, while I don't know exactly how many, I, I know for certain um, I can think of um, roughly up to a dozen different countries that, that celebrate either Black History Month or some um, would celebrate what's called a Black History Day, right? But countries as, as diverse uh, as the United Kingdom, uh, Ireland, uh, Italy, Germany, um, the Netherlands, Brazil, right? So it's a it's a it's a pretty um, diverse uh, set of, of countries that, that celebrate Black History yeah. Month. Did it start with the United States, or do yes. you know? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it did. So um, basically. The, um, all these other iterations of, of Black History Month are all descendants of the, the, the brainchild and the hard work of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And it, it's not uncommon, right, that if, um, if you have a group of people anywhere who feel like they are not being represented, not being acknowledged, and you get a representation or you get an example of another set of people who have made that, um, that, that cause a reality, you think, you know what? We need to get some of that going over here as, as well. Um, so these other Black History Month celebrations have all, I would say, go back to maybe starting in the 80s. Uh, and then there are some as recent as um, about five years ago or so, right? So again, this goes back to the work of Carter G. Woodson, back to 1926. Uh, then that being broadening, uh, broadened out in 1976. And about a decade or so later, you start to see uh, black folks in other countries you know, saying, hey, we've made contributions here as well, um, and they should be acknowledged. Uh, because oftentimes they're not acknowledged in the traditional curriculum uh, in schools and, and acknowledged uh, in, in society in general. So we need to bring that to the fore. So is, is there a website folks can learn all about the activities going on nationally uh, on, during Black History Month? Yeah, so I, I don't know if there is, is one, um, one repository, if you will, uh, but the beautiful thing about um, 2023 is that you can just go to a search engine, uh, type in uh, Black History Month events, and uh, you'll find um, a, a, an array of uh, of websites that will give you information about events here and there. Mm -hmm. So how about in Fargo-Moorhead area and and uh, can you talk about the observances and maybe uh, different programs that are planned that you yeah. know of? Yeah. So uh, locally I think uh, one one place to check would be, uh, it's, I believe it's called FargoEvents.com uh, and it'll give you um, a rundown on, on all, all um, uh, local events there. Um, if you're speaking about NDSU specifically, uh, there you can go to the, the website of the Office of Multicultural Programs, uh, and there is, uh, currently it's uh, uploaded, a listing of all of the events that are happening at NDSU, um, and there are, there are several. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about any of those observances that you might be involved in, or yeah, that so, you know of? Yeah. So one that's, that's very, um, that's been a really great event, I think, if I would have, go back in, in, in my mind, um, I, I would imagine this event has been happening now 
for at least um, close to a decade now, I think. It's called EFRIC. Uh, and it is sponsored by the Black Student Association uh, at, at NDSU. And it is a great celebration uh, of, of black history uh, across the entire diaspora. Um, it's, it's put on by the, by the students. Uh, they, they run it. They perform uh, songs, poetry, uh, speeches. It's a, it's a really wonderful event. And that's, I think that's one of my, my favorite um, events that, that happens uh, at, at NDSU, at mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about race relations in Fargo-Moorhead, and for that matter, in North Dakota? You've been here 14 years yeah, now. Yeah, I've been here, yeah, been here 14 years. So it's, it's interesting you, you mentioned that because um, within that 14 years, it's given me the opportunity to really watch uh, a city and a community grow. Um, if I were to think back to when we first moved here, again, um, 2009, um, I don't think... There was lots, like lots of, of, uh, of diversity represented uh, in the community. And one of the places I got to really watch this happen was in the schools. I spent lots of time uh, out in, in the schools in Fargo, West Fargo, um, and to a lesser degree, Moorhead. But I can even speak to this as a, as a parent. When my oldest son, who is uh, 17 years old now, and he's a junior in high school, when he began kindergarten, I remember in his class, he was um, one of, of two, uh, if I'm not mistaken, two black kids, uh, and that was it, right? Uh, the schools were not very diverse then. Fast forward just a couple of years, and if you want to see the, like, the influx of diversity in Fargo, spend some time looking at the schools, and, and you, you can see it, like, plain as day, right? Um, so the influx of diversity is happening. Uh, with regard to um, how all that's working out in the community, um, I think I'd, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, I'd say in my experience, I can only speak to my personal experience, in my experience Fargo has been a welcoming place. Um, but to determine how truly um, inclusive the community will be I think there's a to be determined there. And what I, what, I, what I mean by that is we now have, through these kids who have moved here with parents and they're flooding the, the school systems, in about a decade or so, these kids are now gonna be adults, right? How welcome are they going to be in the, in the workplace, right? Um, is there going to be um, a diverse representation uh, of individuals in, in Fargo's community across the workforce, right? And, and that would be, for me, um, a great telltale sign about um, just how, um, quote unquote, race relations have, have developed in, in Fargo. Mm -hmm. I understand you've talked uh, a, a lot about maybe affirmative action in the past. Yep. And uh, the Supreme Court might be taking a look at that. Can, can you talk about, you know, what is affirmative action and why was it first implemented? Yeah, so... Give a little bit of background on it. Yep, so uh, affirmative action um, has its roots in, in federal uh, policy. Um, in, in fact, the, the first time the, the term uh, affirmative action uh, was used, I believe it would be 1961, uh, in an executive order from John F. Kennedy, where he spoke about using affirmative action in making sure uh, hiring practices were non-discriminatory um, and that people would not be uh, boxed out of opportunities based upon the language, I believe, was race, creed, color, or national origin, all right? Um, fast forward a couple years, I believe 1965, and uh, Lyndon B. Johnson initiated another executive order, and I believe religion and, and sex was, was added, and then gender uh, followed soon thereafter in about 1968. So those are the, the, the roots um, of, of affirmative action, and the idea, again, was, was simply to, uh, to try to ensure that hiring practices were non-discriminatory in, in our society. What would be the consequences if the Supreme Court o overturned the premise of affirmative action? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, 
And I think, sadly, uh, one of the um, impacts may be a, a less, with, with regard to what they're looking at, right? And they're looking at, uh, at affirmative action as a consideration for higher education ad admission specifically. And I think one of the uh, potential uh, impacts could be a less diverse um, school population uh, in, in higher education, which, which would be unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, maybe a tough question here. What do you, what do you think's been learned since the George, George Floyd's death in 2020, and you look at what's going on in Memphis right now, yeah. and in terms of how, you know, things are changing in the United States? Yeah, um, you know, sadly, uh, I think exactly what's happening right now in, in Memphis calls into question what, what we've learned, if anything, right? Um, you know, if we were to contextualize this and, and look at this specific issue uh, of um, police brutality and uh, as it relates to African Americans, um, this is nothing new. Um, we, so we're looking at a circumstance in Memphis, Tennessee where um, a man was brutally beaten to death um, but you started the question with George Floyd, which was 2020. Uh, and I could rattle off name after name after name, right? Um, if I were to go back 30 years or so, and we could <clears throat> talk about uh, Rodney King or, right? So, and if I were to fast forward to the 70s, I'm pretty sure if I were to talk to, to uh, my elders, they would rattle off names then. So, uh, this is a is a, a deeply rooted um, issue uh, in our in our country, and the 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 truth, the sad truth of the matter is, I'm not sure uh, what we've learned, if anything, because it continues to repeat itself over and over and over again. Hmm. What would Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, think about today if they were still alive? Yeah. So, uh, gosh, that's a that's a heavy weight to, uh, to assume the, the, the thoughts and position that MLK and, and Malcolm X would have. But I, I would say this, uh, based upon their work, I would, there are a couple different perspectives here. In one light, I think they would be, uh, they might be encouraged by some of the, the progress that has been made um, within the African American experience. But I would also say that largely they would be disappointed and, and I'm sure frustrated by the fact that some of the issues, many of the issues, quite frankly, that they were dealing with in 1950, 1960, 19, well, they were both killed before 1970, but the, the issues that, that, they, that they died still wrestling with, we're still dealing with those things now. So, um, but I, I think they would be encouraged by the resilience that, that, uh, that African Americans and, 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 and other uh, Americans of, of good faith uh, are showing, there would absolutely be frustration and disappointment there as well. Real quick, what would you want folks to know about Black History Month they might not know? Uh, I think what I would like people to know is um, to, to paraphrase uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He said, the emphasis should not be on Negro History Week but on Negroes in history. In other words, uh, this is just a part of the historical narrative of this society, right? And um, while we have this, this moment to, to highlight those contributions, uh, there should really be a push and an emphasis to, uh, to be inclusive of the contributions and achievements of African Americans in the larger American historical narrative. So if people want more information, maybe you've already suggested, what's the where's the best place to go? Yeah, the, so in 2023, the best place to go is pull out your phone, get on that laptop, uh, and you can, we can easily do research, all of us, uh, from anywhere at any time, and that's the, the beauty of, uh, of 2023. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for joining us today. Thank, thank you very much for having me. Stay tuned for more. Hannah Lou Woods is a singer and songwriter from Rochester, Minnesota, who constructs heartfelt lyrics and melodies to reflect her own personal journey. She received numerous awards for her folksy, bluesy pop songs and was featured on our series, Prairie Musicians. Oh. 
for a love like you And though I've tried it so many times before They always wanted more than I could give it This what I wanna be loved I believe in a love like that I believe in a love that lasts Beyond the confines of time and space I believe I have known your face So how can a heart forget her past? I believe in a love that lasts Beyond the confines of time and space I believe in a resting place Whoa, breathe in love, let your heart beat be enough, breathe in love, oh let your heart beat be
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008 and by the members of Prairie Public.